Namaskar and welcome once again to Bookaholics Live Talk. Today we have with us Amal Chatterjee, senior course tutor from University of Oxford. Uh, he is a senior course tutor on creative writing and academic writing. And besides that, he is also a published novelist. Uh, his na novel uh, name is Across the Lakes. And uh, apart from the novel, he also has edited books like Representation of India during the 1970s, uh, sorry, during the 1740s to 1840s, and also a book called Writers on Writing. We also have with us Nabin K. Chetri, a Nepali poet based in Aberdeen. He is an MST in creative writing from Oxford University, specializing in prose and poetry. Uh, he has already got an anthology published and it's called Bini. And his forthcoming anthology is going to be published in 2023. It's called I Father. So the main reason for having them here is that uh, Bookaholics in collaboration with Mist and Mountain is conducting a two days writing retreat at Nagarkot in the month of June, uh, tentatively uh, from June, uh, June 2nd to June 4th. And uh, we thought, you know, like since writing, uh, since many of us are novice writers, we've just begun writing, we're interested in writing, there are many students of literature and Bookaholics itself is a platform that is full of writers and readers. And uh, there might be many, many writers who want to, you know, publish their own works and also, what does it take to become a writer? Is it because, you know, just because we have no dearth for vocabulary or we are good at expressing ourselves does not mean that we are capable of writing something. So um, we bring to you the first speaker, Amal Chatterjee. Uh, he'll be speaking for th around 30 minutes. After that, we'll have our second speaker, Nabin Chetri, and then the floor will be open for the viewers. You can put up your questions. You can you know, just note down what they are saying. Hello, Amal. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to awesome. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's great. So, I've just given a brief introduction about yourself and uh, the floor is yours. I've already explained to you. Uh, so it's up to you, the, whatever you want to take it, whichever way. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming and for, for viewing this. Um, as uh, as Saguna, has, uh, Saguna has very kindly explained, we're going to be, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, about the workshops that we'll be conducting uh, and about creative writing in general, about how people can uh, find find things to write about and what we write about. So uh, we're doing a two day workshop. So we'll be staying, we'll be staying together. Uh, and it's an opportunity. I mean, Nabin and I were talking about this. Uh, and one of the great opportunities of uh, two day workshops or multi day workshops is you get the opportunity to, to write, to, to discover ideas, to discover what you want to write about, uh, to think about those ideas and to develop them in a community, in a group of people who are equally interested in writing. And then to spend time and talking, uh, to, talking about writing, considering them as we do that over the evenings and the afternoon and into the following day. Because it's very rare that we get, uh, you know, people get the opportunity to uh, spend uh, extended amounts of time with uh, other writers. And we often have, and I'm sure all of you are uh, readers, we often have time to, uh, to read or to, sorry, I beg your pardon, we often have time to uh, talk to other readers. But uh, writers are, but by definition, writing is often uh, seen as quite a solitary uh, thing, and we do it on our own. However, it, we get inspiration from other people, we bounce off other people, we learn from other people, and we are able to share. And a two-day workshop uh, allows us that, allows you to go away. Uh, it's like, a, well, it is a retreat. Uh, and if you think about, I mean, of course, then, you know, we're used to going away for meditation, spending time on meditation uh, uh, retreats, and this is this is a similar thing. It gives time for your creative ideas to, to, to come forward, to build, to develop them, and then and to, to give them form. Um, I realize that for many people who think, okay, well, writing a story, I've never written a story. I mean, where am I going to find them? I mean, we'll have a conversation a little earlier. Uh, you know, w w I don't know where I'm going to find these characters from. Where do these characters from come from? How do I tell stories? Is, is it actually possible for me to tell a story? I, I, I like stories, perhaps. I watch films, I read books, or watch television, whatever. 
I come across them. Do I have stories in me? And the thing is, everybody does have stories in them. Now, I'm not, not going to go down the road of saying everybody has a novel in them, um, but everybody does have stories in them. If you think back, I mean, all of us, uh, all of us, when we're when we're children, we tell stories. We tell stories to each other, to our parents, but also to ourselves. And we sit around and you have kids telling us, what are you doing? And, like, oh, no. and they'll start telling the story. Those of you who have children or are, are, remember being children, you tell stories. But along the line, uh, along the way, as we grow up, we tend to somehow lose this. We tend to forget that that is, you know, it's intrinsic. Storytelling is, is it makes us, it's one of the things, I'm not saying it's the only thing. It's one of the things that makes us who we are. But we set it aside because we don't tell stories anymore. We stop drawing these pictures. Because you think about it, as a child, you draw a picture. I mean, I was, I was, my, my drawing is terrible, okay? I can tell stories, but my drawing is terrible. But actually, I would draw the pictures and I'd go, oh, this is that, you know, tell some stories, etc." Even in my own head, I'm just drawing, scribbling away, drawing little things. So you all have that in you. Uh, we all have that in you, uh, in you, in us. Uh, and what I want to do and what I try to do through my workshops is... Uh, uh, well, of course, there are different kinds of workshops, but the workshops that we're planning here, what we're going to do is to discover those stories, the roots of the stories within you. So we will we will start by looking at, you know, where do we find characters, for instance? Where do we, uh, how do we develop the characters? And it sounds very kind of dramatic and threatening, but let me give you, let me give you an example, for instance. Um, we've often seen people, we pass people whom we don't know. We just, they're just passing. And some people say, oh, I wonder what he does. And it's actually what, what we what we do often in workshops is we take ideas like that, people we've seen, and we build on them and say, okay, you imagine them. What, what were they like? And say, well, what do you think that person's like? And mm, well, I wonder, maybe, maybe maybe they're going, maybe they're coming back from visiting someone. Well, so who are they visiting? So think about, oh yeah, maybe they're visiting. So why would they visit that person? So, so and as we say, why would they visit that person? Why were they visiting that person? And maybe visiting the person because they needed to get something, because they're a friend. Because that person is sick, or maybe maybe they're angry with that person. I mean, that, that might also be a reason. Or maybe the visit made them angry. And then there's all these things. So there's always a re there's something happening there. So you've got a tension there, a tension in the sense of something that's prompting something. So okay, so why did they go there? So these so you now have a person with another person, and they have a relationship of some form. And this relationship then says, okay, so you've got now you've, you've gone from having no characters to two characters who have a and you don't just have two characters; they have a relationship. They have an interaction, uh, and then you can follow one of the characters down. You can follow one of the characters or both of the characters down. Are they going to meet again? Okay, that's a question. If they're not going to meet again, why not? If they are going to meet again, why? So you, you set up these questions for yourself, uh, and that's what we'll do in the workshop. I mean, I probably won't use that particular uh, exercise, but uh, I will use ideas like that, or we will use ideas, because uh, I'm there. My aim is to facilitate you. I, I'm not going to tell you write this story. The aim isn't to say, okay, look at that landscape, which, as it happens, is from Scotland. Um, uh, I'm not going to say, look. I'm not going to say, look at that landscape. Now, this is the story that, that tell the story of that. You know, I might we might use them as prompts, but I'm not telling you what the story is. You have the stories in you, and what we will do is we'll find ways of allowing you to, you know, to 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 look into yourself or. And I don't mean necessarily have to look into yourself and become necessarily self-reflective, though that's one way of doing it, uh, but also to look outwards, to look out at other things, to look around you and say, okay, what's the story there? Why why is this? I mean, you take this, what's happening here? Why is why is this person here? How did he come here? I mean, you've got this person sitting in, in, on your screen, the pictures of Scotland behind him. You know, he's Indian Sri Lankan, um, and he's talking about doing a workshop in Nepal. So, so where is he? And okay, you, you can spend your time figuring out who he is, but you can also make up who he is. Okay, and say, okay, well, so so who is he? Why is he here? Ah, maybe he's, I don't know, you can think about, you know, uh, maybe he sells things. I don't know what he sells, but he sells stories in this case. Um, maybe he sells things, or maybe he makes things. Uh, or maybe he doesn't make things. Maybe, he, uh, you know, or what is that behind him? Why is that? Is that, is that a rabbit? What's that? What is that? And that is, and just by asking these questions, they start prompting things. And what we will do is we'll use those prompts. And then gradually, as the characters build, as characters build, we start discovering tensions in them, and tensions both in you know uh, in a in a tense way, but also where, they, where people want things. Why do we want? What does it? What does that person want? And what the person could want could be on a big scale, or it could be on a very very small scale. What the person wants might be 
something immediately. You know, I want a drink of water. Okay, there's a drink of water. There. How does a drink of water get there? And you can start slow, slow pump quite easily. And this, this is what we do as children. We say, what are you doing? We say, oh, I'm doing this. Why are you doing that? Well, I'm doing this because da, da, da. And this all builds up. So we start from there. We start with often with people. You can start with places too. We won't go down that road. That's a different, uh, uh, different prompt, a different way of prompting things. Uh, but if, if, if stories eventually come down to characters, to people, uh, well, who could be people or animals, they could be gods, they could be, I mean, of course, they could be rocks too, rocks which talk, whatever you want. Uh, but they come down to characters, so we'll have those characters there. Then you have incidents where they, where, where things happen to these characters. So we'll think about incidents, you know, what happens to this character? You know, he pours a glass of water, he spills the glass of water. Okay, you spill the glass of water, what happens next? So you start having, you start building up a little scene, so something's happening there, then maybe somebody else comes in, maybe this other person whom you met earlier, that person comes in. And if that person comes in, how do they respond to the fact that he, you know, he spilled water, and so on and so forth. And you can build it up. And as you're building them, you hear other people. There's, and the wonderful thing about working in a group is you'll be hearing other people coming up with stories. And what, what happens is people start saying, oh, wait a minute, that's really interesting. Because sometimes it's almost easier to see other people's stories or the stories that they're coming up with. Somebody says, well, I've come up with this person. You go, yeah, but that person could be this. Uh, and, that, and you start bouncing off each other and it helps, helps both, uh, both writers because by this point, or you know, inventors, maybe if you don't want to be a, consider yourself a writer yet, the writer is going to happen. Uh, writing is going to happen a little further down the line. You're still inventing, coming up with stories. So you start inventing these stories, and you inventing you invent for each other. You help each other. You don't have to take everything that anybody else invents. You think, well, oh, that's interesting. I don't, but maybe that gives you another idea. And you've got all this this, this imagination is there. It's just that you've been we've all kind of suppressed it or held it back. Uh, and so, so we'll do that. And then once we do that, we start building the characters, we start building their worlds, the world that they live in, which could be the real world. But even within the real world, what, what elements of the real world are interesting in terms of the story that's being told? Because where they are, I mean, why, why does he have, coming back to this the character sitting in front of you, why does he have a picture of Scotland on, on the wall behind him? He's not in Scotland. I'm actually, as it happens, in, in a completely different country. I'm in Amsterdam. Okay, I'm in the Netherlands, which is I'm in Amsterdam, which is in the Netherlands. So why do I have a picture of Scotland on the wall? And why am I talking to people in um, people in Nepal? And what is this? You know, and so we've got all this. So you can start asking questions, which will then create even more interesting background to it. So you start adding these into the mix and you see which, which bits are particularly interesting, which ones have more you know, life to them. Uh, and then you start adding those together and then you can bring in other characters. You can, and in workshops, we often, what often happens is we borrow, as I said, we borrow characters, but we might also borrow other ideas from other people. Say, oh, that's an interesting idea. If that person has that function or does that job or, you know, does that, uh, has that profession or has that attitude, what if I borrowed a bit of that into mine? And so that you bring that in. Because characters in the end come from, from the real world around us, even if we're completely invented, even if I'm writing a story about a rock, Okay, and the story, the rock is going to have personality. Ah, it has personality. And that personality comes from the idea of it is somehow, but well, it is somehow in a sense human. Uh, and so we have all these ideas. So that all builds up and then we gradually build up a person that's, or a person or personality. And the next stage then is often to, or another stage, if I, if I follow this particular route, there are different routes. The next stage you might decide to say, okay, I want a plot. I want to, you know, how, how do I get to create a plot for this? Because, yeah, something happens to them. But is that, you know, how does that take, take it forward? But the question is, so, so we've got an event. Let's say you, you decide something major happens to them. This major thing happens. But how did they arrive there? So that's the rising action. So it arrives to this point where this critical moment happens. Okay. And this, and then, but then what happens after that? Because if you just, just tell it up to there, that, that's the point. You know, he fell off his chair. Okay. Why did he fall off his chair? What happened after? So he was doing something silly. He was waving his hands. And he somehow slipped and he fell off his chair. That's funny up to a point. Okay, well, you may not consider it funny, but it's, uh, it could be funny. Okay, not, assuming nothing has happened to this person, me. Okay, and I try not to fall off my chair. Um, not, but, but what happens after that? What's the effect of this? And where does it go from there? So we then have the falling action. Then you arrive at some point, which maybe he realizes he needs to fix his chair. To which point, I check my chair. Uh, so, we, I mean, we already have a little bit of a story out there. 
So it's the, the rising action. He's arrived. We've got the rising action. He arrives, sets himself up. But some, I've got an incident. I've got a scene of somebody of something happening here, of, of a story of a little arc. And you know, and what happens? What does he learn from that? Check your chairs before you sit on them. Okay, it's, it's, it's a, and it's not really a moral, but it sounds almost like a moral. But okay, so this is kind of a, a jokey moral story, a little jokey moral story. Then you have a series of incidents. But then which? So people have lives. Your character then starts having a series of incidents. And which incidents then? Add up, okay. Which do you want the falling off the chair incident? Is the, does he learn immediately after falling off the chair? Does something else happen in between? The, the, does he need several other incidents, etc.? So we start putting some incidents together, and then we try to create we create an arc, as we call it, you know, the story arc. So we then have this arc of the story, which sort of rises to the the point of the climax, the crisis. And people use different words, and then it falls away, and it arrives at a at a different point, and at the end of it, you go, ah, right, that's interesting. We've arrived somewhere. And that makes it a story because that's what we see in, well, that's what we used to. We watch it in films again. Those people, films are very come, but read it in books too. It always goes up. It goes up to a point and then it goes down again. And that's one of the key things. So we'll then look at the plots. The plots aren't all, plots often need work. So what we'll do, so the first day we'll work often on, uh, on uh, people and places. Uh, we'll work on description too. How do you describe a place without giving uh, too much? You know, um, without going on forever, because of course you can describe something forever and ever. I mean, even again, looking at this, you could describe me in terms of the way I look, the clothes I'm wearing, and then you decide, okay, let's talk about what he's got his bookshelf behind behind him. I don't know how much you can see, but you could start talking about. But just listen, the books could go on forever, so you might pick out a few books. So there's some books like you know, there's quite a few orangeish books in the top. I'm just looking at actually orange appears at several points. There's orange appears at very at various points. There's a lot of white to etc and some of them kind of jump out i have no idea why uh, why those ones jump out i haven't thought about this okay and occasionally they're uh, perhaps you know different languages so you pick out which details are so you add all these all of these things come together and then you go okay i've got this big kind of pot of things you know um and it could end up a kitchen of course <laughs> okay you can end up this huge pot of things. the question is how do you uh, which ones do you need now because it's relatively in that sense it's relatively easy to come up with a set of with some prompts. So we'll work on that. How do you prompt design is coming along? How do you choose them? How do you develop this into a big, a, into an arc which arrives at a place? And the aim will be to help you to, to start, uh, to start stories from, from, from scratch, if you want. And for people who don't want to start from scratch, we will have people, I'm sure, who will be coming along, or quite possibly, who will come along and say, I have a story. But what we're doing when we're talking about places and people, etc., it's the same thing that we need, whether you're inventing something or you have something that is already ready, you need to look at those. So we look at those characters and those ideas, and you, know, you, can, uh, you look at those characters, those ideas, and say, okay, what is happening here? Why does it work? Or why do I kind of feel it doesn't quite work? Oh, maybe I need it. A little bit more of that, this, or a little bit more of that. So, so you bring in those ideas. So, so we'll work on all, all that. And by the end of the uh, two days, okay, and so, sorry, at the end of the first day, then you have time to go away and think and talk to the others about it outside the writing practice, because we'll be writing the sessions very much so, writing the sessions, sharing, talking to each other. So you'll, you'll do that in the evening. The next day, you'll be build on that. And by the end of it, uh, you'll have a story. It's as simple as that. I mean, that's the thing. Will it be the perfect story? Will it be the story you want in exactly the condition you want? Perhaps, perhaps not. But we'll have to see. But you'll have enough there to work on to tell a fuller story. Will you take the story out and complete it and publish it? Will you just keep it for some time? Will you use it as an excerpt? Different people will do different things with it. But you'll also have developed a, a community. You're no longer alone. You're no longer just this person sitting there writing in, uh, writing in a little... A corner in the in their room, or you know, they've well, got a big room, okay, or sitting in a cafe, etc. You're writing. You now got people to talk to, share your writing with, and you know, again, this is something that uh, I and uh, Nabeen and uh, other writers have experienced. It's it's wonderful because you're no longer you're no longer alone, and you've got other people who are interested in what you're doing, who have similar uh, experiences, and who want to talk about it and can talk about it because. Reading and writing are very different things. They're related, obviously, but we read stories, but to take them forward, to, to create our own, we need to go somewhere else. But you do have it. I mean, you, you could almost argue that the, the creating of a story is almost more uh, basic uh, than, the, than the, the, the reading of a story. The, the list, listening to stories is why perhaps we, uh, perhaps how we have come around to actually starting to create stories.
So that's what we'll do. And then at the end of the day, you have a story, you have characters, uh, you have, you will have discovered that you can tell stories. Is this a story you want to tell? Well, that will be up to you to decide. Is part of this what you want to use? That's also possible. Is this a story you want to complete? Is this going to be the impetus for another story? Uh, and I know from uh, past experience with, you know, uh, with students is some students will go away and they will then create entirely new uh, stories from, from that starting point, or they will go away and say, okay, this, that was this, that story. I put it aside, but it's like it's like learning to paint. If you learn the basics of how to use a brush and you paint a little bit of a picture, you may not be entirely set, but you know the techniques of doing that. So that then allows you to take it forward yourself in your own time, in your own space, and to tell, to start creating other stories, uh, the stories that you want to tell, and to start beginning to see stories, because that's also, you, you start seeing stories around, you start using your imagination again. This is going back to something that's very, very fundamental to all of us, storytelling. As children, we tell stories. So what I'm going to do in some ways is to take you back uh, to that, but also to take you forward because children don't necessarily, children don't necessarily I'm not saying, but there are some very brilliant children out there who wouldn't dare to uh, criticize them, uh, but children don't necessarily see that you know, there is a fullness, so there's an art to it, it's got to go on, it's it got to arrive somewhere. Uh, and that children will often serialize stories too, of course. But of course, if you want to serialize stories, it's up to you. So that's what, we're, that's what I uh, hope to do with you. I intend to do with you. Um, and I am very, very much looking forward to it. I'm sure it's going to be a, a wonderful experience. It's been a long time since I've uh, been in the uh, area of the hills. I mean, I went to school as it happens in uh, just across, well, a little, little across the border in, in Kershaw, in, uh, uh, in Darjeeling, but uh, it's a very long time ago. So uh, I was listening in earlier trying to remember my Nepali, but now I'm afraid it's... Uh, it's long gone, but maybe some of it will come back. Um, so that's that's my plan for you. Uh, and I know that some of you will have some questions and uh, very much looking forward to hearing those questions and to responding to them. So uh, I think at this point, I will probably hand it back. And um, yes, I see we have some question here. Okay, uh, thank you for sharing. Let's Okay, thank you for sharing all the good stuff. Well, where do you get the energy to write every day or what motivates you? What kind of exercises do you do to generate that creative feeling every day? Any recommendations? Oh, that's a lot of questions. Okay, um, where do you get the energy to? Uh, writing is, uh, well, it's like anything that you enjoy. Uh, well, it is something that I enjoy. And so it is something that, you know, um, you have to find time for. It's as simple as that. You need to find time for it. If you enjoy running, you need to, it doesn't happen by itself. So you need to find time to run. But at the same time, as with running, as with anything else, one of the things to realize, and this is what motivates, because it can be dispersed. You write something, you think, no, okay, nothing's going to happen with this. But what motivates is you realize that everything's learning. It's like it's like running. It's like anything else. Practice makes you, helps you to develop and helps you to, uh, to go forward. Uh, what kind of exercises do you do to generate that creative feeling every day? I think one of the key ones is actually just having a rhythm. Uh, developing a rhythm and sometimes I mean sometimes there are periods when you realize that this is not going to happen but being aware and preparing for that saying look in the next two or three days because of x y or z where you know I've got a lot of work uh, other work I'm going to a wedding or whatever not that I'm going to weddings these days in COVID times um, so so you allow for that but plan it it's it's something that it's something like anything else that you do and you need to plan it you need to find it dinner doesn't happen just because it happens I say yeah, dinner happens because you plan to have dinner and you enjoy dinner because you've planned to have it and you sit down to have it if you enjoy eating, eating and cooking, etc., which as it happens, I do. Uh, and so that's that's what that's what those would be my recommendation. Plan it, find the time for it, and bear in mind it's practice, it's always practice. I mean the perfect line will come sometimes, the perfect story will come sometimes, but other times you're practicing. And practice makes perfect. It's like anything else. You want to be a great footballer, you're gonna to have to go out there and practice most of the time. You're just kicking a ball, just within quotes, kicking a ball around. No, no, you're doing a little more than just kicking a ball around. You're practicing with that. Uh, more questions? Um, my pleasure. Um, 
I have a question that was very informative, Amal. Thank you so much. Uh, suddenly, it feels like I too can become a fiction writer, and I'm sure you are something that, that I'm always very scared of. You know, because I I've always felt that I cannot, uh, I'm not into this fictional world, and I cannot create uh, stories out of the characters or the elements that I see around me. But suddenly, it feels like um, I too can write a story. So thank you very much for uh, you know for that. And um, my uh, question to you would be, you know, Shobha Day somewhere mentioned uh, that I think it was in the literature festival uh, held mm -hmm. here uh, back in I, I, two three years ago. She mentioned that she writes two thousand words every day. So how important is it? You know, uh, like Haruki Murakami has also said uh, that you know what he talks uh, when in, in one of his book. Uh, what I talk about when I talk about running. So it's mm -hmm. basically about the book is basically about writing as a practice. Mm -hmm. So do you think it is important for the aspiring writers to write something, at least make an effort to write something as a practice every day or not? Well, certainly it's, it's important to make a practice. It's not going to happen without practicing. And I, I think that's, it's a, I mean, uh, the Murakami uh, analogy is quite a, is a good one, very good one, no? because it's, and it happens to time when I was talking about the idea, I mentioned that idea of running. Uh, because if you don't practice, it isn't going to happen. The idea that you can go out there and, well, to take the analogy of running for, the, for a minute uh, longer, if the idea that you're going to go out there and do the perfect run isn't going to happen. You've got to practice and you're going to stumble. You're going to you know, uh, have to, you know, get, you're going to ache a bit here and there. And the same is true with writing. You, you really need to develop a rhythm for yourself. Uh, and what different people do at different times. I mean, I have friends I know who, uh, writer friends who some some of them will wake up at five o'clock in the morning and they will say every day we write between five and seven. That would not work for me. I do not wake up at five. If I do wake up at five o'clock in the morning, I want to go back to bed or have a cup of tea or whatever. It, that's not for me. I mean, I tend to work later in the evening. That, that's my time. So I then set aside and say, okay, this is the time I'm going to do. It. So I think that's that is really important. You need to you need to create a rhythm for yourself, a pattern for yourself. What the pattern and the rhythm is will vary from person to person. So as uh, it's just, you know, uh, Shobha there has, um, has her uh, target of 2,000 words. And I know people who do similar things like that. Uh, and I, I do, I'm, I will confess for myself, I do vary my targets. It's like, because, but it also depends on what, you, what I'm doing, you know, well, in terms of the, the writing. Sometimes, sometimes I need to get a number of words on the page because I need to take it forward. And other times it's like I'm going to have to do an editing task, etc. I'm going to revise it. And I tend to find that if I give the time for it, I'm not, sometimes I go in there and think, it's just it's not going to happen. Uh, and I'll spend a lot of time trying to get into it. And then eventually it does, because I've got the practice of it. At some point it clicks. But unless I have the practice, it's not going to happen. And I, it's not going to happen because, well, I, A, I don't have the practice, and B, because I spend my time worrying that it's not going to happen. But if I know it happens, then I stop worrying about the fact that it hasn't happened quite yet. So I'm trying to write my 2,000 words, and I haven't got 2,000 words. Okay, it didn't happen today. So tomorrow I come in at the same time, same place, or whatever my pattern is. And I go, go at it again. And at some point, it comes out. It'll come through. Does that, I hope that answers a bit. Um, my pleasure. Okay, for the ice, sorry. Uh, I see some notes there. Yeah, okay. Not with the private chats. Any other questions? I can't hear. Sorry, definitely yes. Uh, I think we have some other questions coming up. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about uh, how important it is to rewrite because uh, most of us, you know, most of us, uh, we are just too tired or we are just not interested in writing several drafts and mm -hmm. i think uh, it's it, it's important for writers to uh, prepare not only to prepare an outline sketch about uh, everything that you said but it's also important to rewrite so how much of rewriting is necessary uh, that 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 okay, that's almost how long as a piece of string in a sense uh, but to, to be more, uh, to be realistic, but yes, we need to revise. There is, well, there may be the, the rare occasion where that we'll have uh, 
and the things will happen immediately. But you do need to revise. And again, like like the writing itself, you need to develop your own techniques and you know, need to work on what works for you. Are you going to revise on a daily basis? Some people can do that. Uh, are you going to revise on a weekly basis? Are you going to arrive, revise when you reach a certain point? I personally prefer to write for some time and then go back to revision. Because it gives me some, I like to get distance from the, there's a, uh, somebody talked about, you know, the living writing to drain on the sideboard for a while. So sometimes I'd even work on more than one idea at a time. And then that allows me to come back to the first one. So I, I write a, a story or part of a story or part of a concept even. Uh, then I go away and work on something else. And then I can come back to it. So revision is really important. But very often you need distance in, or you need uh, some way of seeing it again. That again is something that a workshop is, can be really good. It, can, it speeds things up in some ways, because you're getting that immediate response from, from other people around you, or you're getting the response from when you tell it, you can you see and you hear how other people respond to it. And that allows you, that gives you the impetus to revise, because otherwise revising can, you know, uh, can, uh, can feel like a bit of a chore, but uh, it doesn't have to be, because the finished product then comes up. Again, it's, if you take an analogy of, you know, um, I don't know, sculpture, for instance, if you're sculpting something, or may, maybe, okay, I can't sculpt, <laughs> probably plasticine is the level of my, um, artistic uh, ability but even there you, you keep revising it and you keep making it until it looks the way you want and then at some point you realize okay this is the way this is the way i want it to be and that's when the revision is done um and you're ready to move on to the next thing and sometimes you, you may want to put it aside and come back to it and sometimes the projects and ideas that I come back to sometimes weeks months even years later uh, i'll go hey, wait hang on a second i had that idea let me let me look at that so uh, yeah, that's uh, somebody I think asked a question about two different people will have to. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, you observe the same environment, same society, but one person can present the scenario in beautiful words, but another can't. What's the difference between these two people? Um, I think the same could be true of a single person. You can look at the same, same scenario, and on some occasions you can tell it well, and on other occasions you can't tell it well. Uh, What's beautiful beautiful to one person is not necessarily beautiful to another. I and mean, that's why we've got, you know, books that, the books that I like, which you probably hate, okay, possibly, whoever you are, okay, and vice versa. Maybe hate is too strong, but it's quite possible. I hate not in the sense of I think it's a terrible book. There's no way I'm going to read that or a story that I, there's no way. We all have tastes. So, um, and you need to find your own your own voice. And the different people have different voices. That's it's really important to, 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 uh, to realize. Um, and uh, what you, how, how you tell it, sorry, how beautiful, beautiful, I mean, I suppose I could use the cliche in a sense, you know, the beauty is in the eyes of the person who's seeing it. Uh, so what you see and how, uh, uh, whether it is beautiful or, uh, or not is what you see and how you see it. So there is no, uh, I would argue that there is no difference, but is, is one going to be more beautiful to other people or more, that, that's quite possible, yeah. Uh, that's quite likely. And that's why we say, okay, so so and so is a beautiful writer. I mean, I mean, for instance, is a great poet. I mean, he's a wonderful poet. And uh, uh, I, I I dare say that I can't write poetry like him. Uh, in fact, I know I can't write poetry like him. I would love to write poetry like him. I mean, whom you will meet uh, shortly. Uh, and some of you may already know, but um, that's, uh, uh, that's the way it is. Um, okay. Natural born writers with no creative writing training. Um, everybody is, okay, in terms of uh, t t taking it more specifically in the area that I, uh, that I deal with, as, as I said, everybody is a storyteller. We're, we're all storytellers. How satisfying the stories are and to whom will vary. Um, and you ask the question of difference between natural born writers with no creative writing training. Uh, everybody is, has the potential to be a writer. How good they'll be, how much effort they're willing to put into it, how long it will take, that varies. Um, people who have training in creative writing, uh, people who work with others, yeah, they've got an advantage. Uh, but it's, you know, so uh, because they have feedback, they may be getting feedback on it, so that uh, that helps. Is that going to change the quality of the output? Uh, I, again, it varies from person to person and from writer to writer. I, we certainly learn from it. I, I know myself, I mean, I started writing without, 
uh, having had the time I started writing with the, with the relatively few. But I know over the years working in workshopping with my with fellow writers and people who want to write. I mean, I workshop with people who were who are necessarily and necessarily published yet, uh, and some of them you know, are still working on their work. And you know, I worked with them, I read and written with them for many years. So that's uh, that 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 does take. Uh, different forms with different people. Um, not necessarily uh, difficult. Is it, so the question is, is it uh, must be familiar with difficult words, right? Not necessarily, not all writers use difficult words. You don't, again, thinking back on the idea of being a child, children don't necessarily use difficult words. Very simple words can tell a story. So no, you don't, you don't need it. Uh, you do have to. You do have to read. I would argue to if to tell a good story. You can you can create a story, but to tell a story that satisfies you and other people, you do need to read. Uh, but I mean, we're a bookaholic, so I think uh, I think that's a given. It's unlikely that you uh, if you don't read at least a reasonable amount. Um, oh. Thank you, thank you, Amal. Uh, you, you, you. It's really wonderful that this session is turning out to be really very interactive, with lots of questions coming in from the uh, from the readers, from the viewers. Let's say because this is something that un is something very unlikely to happen during the live sessions. You know, they have got lots of questions and all. You also have some private questions, I guess, from your friends who have also joined you. So if yes, you could yes. check and answer, oh, yeah. and then. Mm -hmm. Sorry, shall I? Uh... Yeah, you can. You can. Okay, so yeah, I just saw a couple of questions there. Okay, so a couple of private questions came in. What are the plans for these retreats in the coming years? Uh, I think I can say fairly safely say yes. We have every intention of uh, of doing these again. Uh, so we shall see. Yeah, we shall see how it goes. I mean, we, we have the intent intend to do it. Another question is: Writers block a real thing? Oh yes, there, it is definitely a real thing. However, uh, in the sense of we all feel it. But going back to our previous. Uh, a suggestion that you know um, you need to find you, you need to make yourself right. It's not going to happen unless you do it. You're not going to you're not going to run if you don't go running. Uh, and um, so you need to you need to write. Yeah. Well, there's a writer's block, a real thing as a claim game you play ourselves. Yes. Uh, it's oh, that's a question I'm answering. I beg your pardon. Thank you, guys. Uh, there was another question which I'm which was on the screen which I missed. Uh, more questions. More the questions, more the ideas. What does it take to be a good writer in terms of content and writing? Uh, what should be done with the great ideas running in mind? Well, first, one important thing to do is if you have ideas, write them down. I think that's really important. If you don't write the ideas down, uh, you're never going to be able to look at them. And if you think you're not too sure whether it's um, whether you can take it forward yet, uh, well, write it down and come back to it. I mean, when I say come back to it, it does. It, it could be later in a few hours or you know. A few days, come back to it and look at it and say, "Well, and that's what we'll do." I mean, okay, uh, th that's what we'll do in, in the sense of the workshops. Give you the the give you the chance to see what you can do with with, with the very smallest bit of an idea and how you can build that into a full story, into a big story. Um, what does it take to be a good writer in terms of content and writing? Um, good question. I'm afraid. Uh, what does it take to be a good writer in terms of content? Uh, you've got to love what you're writing about. You've got to care about it. Uh, if you don't care about it, you're not going to be able to uh, write it. You, and when I say care about it, you can care about it in different ways. It may be a theme that you're very interested in. It may be a character you're very interested in. It may be a place you're very interested in. I mean, uh, working with people, writing stories. It's like, I want to tell the story of this place. And the place becomes the character in them anyway. So you've got to be passionate about what, what you're writing about. That, that'll, that's absolutely essential to good writing. Otherwise, I mean, you can turn out a good, uh, other people, I mean, there are people who sometimes can turn out a good sentence, but that isn't necessarily, they themselves would necessarily consider good, good writing. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I share my favorite books and authors? Oh God, I, I, that is so hard. Um, Marty Leinbach, who's lurking in there, is one of my favorite uh, writers, in, both as a writer and a person. Nabin is another one. Uh, it's it's very very hard. You just peer at my bookshelf behind me. I'll, I'll just look around and tell you some. Actually, uh, I think this in Altia, I've got from A to M, so I, I don't know. It's very hard to tell. That's That's right. Sorry. That's right. Well, you look around and uh, you know look look through the questions uh, once again. 
to see if you have missed out anything, we could we could probably ask Nabin to step in and talk about the creative writing uh, retreat that we are having, and also uh, questions like why is Nepali literature not being able to take remarkable place in the world literature? So I think uh, that is something probably Nabin could answer. So yeah. we'd like to take a break for some time and uh, let's have Nabin. Thank you, thank you, Amar. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you. Oh, hi. <clears throat> um, so, uh, just about, this writing retreat is also going to be about poetry writing. So there are a few questions that, you know, one, one of them being why Nepali literature is not being able to take remarkable place in the world uh, literature. So probably you could shed some light on that and uh, talks a little bit about poetry writing and what it takes because you know everything. Uh, poems are something that I dread. You know, it's very difficult. I feel that it's very difficult. This is the genre of writing that I dread personally. Uh, I've all I've, these days I've seen that there are no like there's nothing. Uh, uh, not a certain pattern that the poets really follow. Uh, so what is the new trend? Uh, because sometimes I feel like something that I write in this manner is written in this manner and it becomes a poem and I, 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 I'm not okay with it. So probably you could shed some light on poetry writing and how as a writer has been the journey to you because you've already been published and you're waiting for your next publication in the year 2023. That's a long, long, long time to, you know, uh, and you need to be really patient with that because we often feel that once we write something it needs to be published or we're good enough to be published so we take criticisms and um, you know rejections very harshly that's uh, that's what i feel uh, personally i'm sure other people can also relate to it so there are there are new writers who have been uh, wanting to get published but still uh, because uh, you know the manuscripts and all, they get rejected time and again. Uh, so it's really frustrating. So if you could throw a little light on all these things. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Saguna. Uh, I guess you can hear me. Yes, you're clear. So uh, before saying something, uh, with the permission of my guru over here, uh, Amal Chatterjee, uh, it's a privilege, uh, and with his kind permission, and I have another guru uh, at the backstage, Marty Lembeck. <clears throat> She's a famous author and uh, author of Dying Young uh, as well, which was made into a Hollywood movie. So she's also there. So with permission, and also I'd like to thank Saguna, a wonderful friend of mine, and to all the Bookaholics audience, I mean, before I forget, uh, I just want to say a few lines. Bookaholics has been phenomenal, especially during this lockdown. Uh, I think so you guys have done a wonderful job, uh, all those uh, uh, faces behind Ganesh Karkizi, who is right now at the backstage, uh, and uh, Silky Moonri and uh, Vivek Adhikari. So, uh, I mean, I want to give a big round of applause to all of you. And I think it's this is the uh, this is a very historical. Nobody in Nepal has ever done that uh, because I can see that from uh, outside. So uh, this creative writing uh, retreat uh, that we have planned for June, uh, as I think so, Amal has spoken a lot about that, and it's also to, to give you a loan time for yourself uh, to write over there and. Uh, also, uh, there'll be a big community of like-minded people, and that that that's where you can share your feelings, uh, share your writings. I think so that that matters a lot, and you also have time to write yourself, reflect as well, and uh, you know, like there'll be a workshops, and uh, I can see that you know, like when you at the end of the workshop, you'll be refreshed and. Each one of you, whoever comes over there, will go away, go home with a story or a poem. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, regarding poetry, I don't know, it's a, quite a complicated thing, but uh, I'll share a little bit of my own experience. 
when I was in Nepal, I, I don't know, I just started when I was quite small. I used to write a lot, and uh, but I never knew what it meant to the world, you know, like. And when I came to the United Kingdom, uh, I used to, uh, you know, submit a lot of poetry to journals here, there, you know. I used to, I started getting rejections, you know, one, two, three. I think you have got more than 100 rejections to, uh, you know, like for a for a guy from Nepal, you know, like, and uh, those rejections used to be frustrating at first, but later on, I saw that, no, I need to do something more. And then the only key is you read and write and practice. I think so, as Amal said, that you just have to practice. There's no other shortcut to that, and it'll build up, build up slowly. The the cause, the main uh, uh, purpose of the writing retreat also is also to give a type of a, a resi you know, the feeling of a residency. You know, um, that that's quite common among us writers and poets all throughout the world. Uh, they go, they they can buy time, and uh, it's to tend yourself. You know, like you don't have to. Uh, you are breaking a routine, and. Uh, you are loving yourself, you know, like you are giving time for yourself. Like suppose if your name is, let's say, Gopal. Okay, Gopal, I'm giving time for myself, you know, like you're reading. And, and uh, this is happening in Seren Valley Resort. I think it's Seren Resort, Seren, Seren Valley Resort in Nagarkut. So we'll be over there on the 2nd and 3rd, and on the 4th we'll get back. And... Uh, Okay, and our, our, this is happening with uh, in collaboration with the Bookaholics. Uh, before that, we planned to launch a, a competition, creative writing competition. Uh, it might be a short story or, or a poem uh, that I think will so, come through Bookaholics as well. Um, and uh, uh, there'll be some time to for the uh, to submit your creation and will give the award during the residency. So that'll give a bit of a, you know, like connection with the residency as well. The second thing is Mr. Mountain has also launched, uh, uh, sorry, will launch uh, Jared Rochford International Poetry Competition. It's quite international and uh, we'll send the links over there as well. Uh, it's judged by Dr. Wen Price, uh, who is a creative writing coordinator at the University of Aberdeen. And uh, we'll also give opportunity, you know, to post it there. And we would want, uh, you know, uh, audience for the bookaholics and creative writers, poets, aspiring writers, uh, students uh, from Nepal to take part in that. And uh, it's 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 uh, the the creative writing uh, uh, competition is hosted in memory of Jared Rochford, a, a wonderful poet who passed away last year. Uh, the first prize we're giving away is 150 pounds with a plaque uh, written by, uh, you know, um, uh, with a plaque of Jared's poetry. And uh, the second and third uh, runners up will get 50 pounds as well as a plaque as well. Uh, regarding the residency, and uh, we've right now set up a, like 40 places, a first come first basis. So uh, you can book your spot uh, through Mission Mountain website as well, or you can contact Saguna Sa or bu the Bukalix team uh, to book a place. Uh, other than that, So as I said, that uh, we've uh, Saguna was asking me why, uh, what's happening to Nepali literature, you know, why it isn't, uh, why isn't it, um, you know, uh, lagging behind and all this in terms of international representation. And all uh, I can't, uh, I don't have the authority to say that, but uh, what I can see as a poet is that I, I see that there's a very less representation of poets uh, writing in Nepali. It's not because of them. we have we have wonderful poets in Nepal uh, writing in Nepali, but I think there's a lack of uh, translation uh, or rightful translation. That's that's not going 
uh, you know, in the right place. Uh, so uh, we've also started, uh, you know, like independent translation uh, by keeping in view uh, of that particular problem. So we are not doing, you know, like uh, novel at the moment, but we're doing poetry and short stories. So if you're interested, then you can get in touch with uh, 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 Bookaholics team as well or the independent translation, you know, through that you can find it in Mist and Mountain as well. So the major purpose of the uh, of that translation is to focus more on poetry so that uh, it goes into the international, uh, it goes into interna international journeys. So as a, So keeping that in view, what we have we are trying to do right now is, or what we are doing right now is, uh, we are creating a, we are publishing an anthology of thirty Nepali uh, Nepali poets, whether they write in Nepali or English, and uh, if they write in Nepali, we're translating that into English, and if they are writing in English, we're translating that into Nepali. So the project, again, uh, is called a view from my window. So we've, we have a few poets whose name I'm going to read out who are the part of this. Uh, we've got Abhi Sir, Abhi Subedi Sir, Bhishma Upreti, uh, Saguna Saha, Mukul Dahal, Sarsoti Lamishani, uh, Rajav, uh, Mukahang Limbu, uh, Tulsi Divasa, Sirzan Abhiral, LB Chetri, Isor Kadel, Bhupin Kharga. And we have, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just, uh, once everything is complete, we'll, we'll let just wanted to give a hint of what we are doing in terms of promoting uh, poetry translation. And uh, on the poetry forefront, like uh, like what type of workshop is the poetry? Poetry. Uh, what what we are going to give during the workshop? Like I just want to give a small bit, bit of a. Let's say the workshop uh, can be uh, anything like it can be like writing from a memory. It can be uh, writing using your senses uh, in writing poetry. Uh, like, for example, uh, we might be told to, OK, think of a uh, think of a place where you have been, you know, like and you write two sentences, then you write, OK, think of someone, you know, your relatives or near dear ones or lover and then it might be okay what can you remember the time of the day or uh, is it evening you know is it morning so then you'll be writing then it can be like uh, can you feel something uh, like sense of touch you know is it the, can you feel the wind or can you feel the salt on the leaves uh, on your tongue or something like that so it will be basically uh, the incorporation of senses memories uh, and at the end of the day uh, i mean you'll have written a poem so that, there's various uh, type of things that we'll be doing during that workshop uh, have I missed something Yeah, uh, I'll just see if there's any question over there. Yeah. What is the British view of American creative writing versus their British, English British view? Uh, I don't know much about this. I don't think so. I'll. <laughs> Again, I can speak about that. Uh, I think creative writing is something, uh, it's quite healing, you know, like I uh, just wanted to, uh, it's it's quite healing. I've seen a friend who, who was saved, from, who tried to commit suicide and, you know, poetry saved her. So, and uh, these days poetry is being used in uh, hospital premises as well uh, for mental health. So it gives, when you, when you express something through poetry, uh, I think it will give you 
a sense of well-being as well. Yeah. Okay. Is there any more question? Uh, sorry about that. I couldn't answer that. Really, to your friend. Uh, perhaps Amal can answer that later. And yeah. there's one question: Was it a struggle for you to be accepted as a uh, English writer with your background from outside of Britain? Yeah, yeah, that was. That was uh, I think it was uh, quite a struggle. Many years, I think, before my first poem got uh, published in a good journal. So, uh, yeah, a struggle in terms of the language is struggle in terms of. You know, now it's now it's quite. Uh, uh, we, do, we don't have if you if if you have a good quality then uh, they won't care you know like uh, it, ju it just goes for the quality but when you come you know uh, when I first came from Nepal it was quite a struggle for me but but the struggle was that I needed uh, I needed more information I had to get used to rejections I had to get used to uh, you know and the other thing is what uh, you know uh, you might face is it's not a technical course like for example it's not like a doctor or engineer you get a job you get paid like if you if you if you are into poetry for uh for money then i, I don't think so that would be the wrong uh, wrong place you know like you you don't know where the future is but you just love poetry you know that so the love and the uh flair has to be there Navin, there's one more question for you um when you are writing something in a language other than your own, would you think uh, it in your mother tongue first and translate it in English or any other language? Could you share your lifelong experience on it? Uh, when I write, I think I, I mostly write on memories. Uh, 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 memories evoke and uh, they they touch me, you know. Like, and uh, I also write about nature. And uh, when thinking about poetry in your head, um, yes, of course, the first thing it, I mean, uh, you feel more comfortable with the mother tongue. But uh, I have to admit that I'm, I'm not good at writing in Nepali, I, though I've tried a few poems. And uh, yeah, first you, you think in your mother tongue and then you try to translate. But one good thing about uh, writing about, you know, there's a lot of things to write about Nepal, which uh, I'll just read one poem uh, at last, you know, like, just to give you a sense of how you can uh, bring your background into your poetry, which is quite uh, marginal, you know, like, which is quite, not many people have written, you know, like, just because of the, maybe there's a huge barrier of language that prohibits Nepalese literature from coming into the world literature. Uh, and uh, think about like 100 years of solitude, it's wonderfully translated, but you won't know that it's, I mean, it was, it is a translator because so f such fine you know like so i think so a little bit more investments should do. all the creatives from nepal and uh, like us you know like we should invest more on those translation portals rather than you know like just uh, doing individual translation you know, like we just see where where we stand uh because uh, there's no doubt of, about this phenomenal uh, i mean in terms of quality uh, we've got but we just have to have that rightfully translated. Uh, yes, Naveen, I have a question for you. There's a sense of longing. I've been reading your drafts. I've read your poetry book. And there's a sense of longing, you know, longing for home. You're quite nostalgic when you write poetry. And uh, can you shed a little light on this? So much of longing in writings. Uh, do you yeah, miss home it, often? Like, why did you, I, I find that you miss home a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just because physically I haven't been able to. The yeah, wind is always over there, you know. Like, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a very good subject maybe to write about. Even in Gerard Rochford poetry competition, the theme is family. So, uh, what 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 I think that means is, you know, like home family, childhood, that's important to everybody and it's it means a lot to everybody. And uh, the fact that where is home, what is home, that's 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 a that's quite an interesting and intricate question as well. You don't know where is home. Is it uh, is it a place where you are living or is it where you're born, you know, like so maybe uh, my uh, my poem swings swing between those two 
realities, you know, like, and, uh, uh, you know, somewhere, and, and memory helps, you know, like, to get those feelings out, you know, in forms of, in, in form of the most distilled uh, version of language, you know, the poetry, distilled form of language. Mm -hmm. um, one more question to you, Nobin, um, from myself. Uh, is it possible for the readers, uh, for the aspiring writers over here, after taking the workshop uh, that Mist and Mountain is organizing along with Bookaholics, is it possible for um, aspiring writers to join Mist, Mist and Mountain's creative writing workshop in Aberdeen? Is it possible? If, if so, what is the process of you know getting uh, involved in? I, I think you know. I've, I thought I, I would talk about that, and that's what I was. I, I nearly missed. Thanks for reminding, Saguna. Yeah, Mist and Mountain Residency right now is open for international applications from the twenty third of, of. I mean, uh, from the twentieth uh, of May. It's in the website, and we have a deadline of thirtieth May, and uh, the residency is starting on the 23rd of July till the, for, for, for one week and three days as well. But right now it's just self-funded. So we are working with, a, you know, like fun people. If you get funded, definitely, uh, I mean, uh, you're you're most welcome to apply. And uh, it's set in Aboin. It's near Balmoral Castle, uh, you know, where the queen goes every year. She spends three months. Uh, so, and we have, uh, you know, uh, we have you know a partnership with the castle premise as well that means any creatives who come over here uh you know you can get a tour of the uh, state as well you know like so uh with a kind permission of the ranger so so that's a good thing you know like it's, it's just near the uh, royal decide uh balmoral castle and uh once it's open it'll, it'll be on the website uh, as well you know the, the funded but if you you can come anytime, you can apply for the uh, self-funded option, and uh, more will be more information will be updated on the website. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nobin. Uh, there are two questions. Uh, probably, uh, maybe Amal can step in to answer those uh, two questions that have been left out. And uh, we also have Marty Lembich with us, with, who I would uh, I would like uh, to be introduced by Amal because uh, he could he would be the right person to be talking about Marty Lembich. And she has responded back that okay, she she's willing to share some of her words with us. So at the end of the session, maybe after you're done with the questions, you could probably introduce Marty Lembich uh, with us. Thank you, Amal. There, there are two questions. Uh, I think, what is the view, a uh, British view of American creative writing uh, versus, in, I don't know, English British? Is one superior than the other? Amal, I think your microphone is still muted. I'm tempted to bring Marty in here as our American colleague, uh, but she's also British. She's actually in some ways, she, she lives in Britain very much. Um, and uh, I, I don't actually live in Britain, so, uh, uh, and so, so it's all slightly, and, and actually that's quite a good good point because well, it is, it's, it's not that easy, it's, it's complicated. I don't think there's, uh, uh, I, I don't think there's any, uh, there may be some uh, uh, competition sometimes, uh, uh, but on, on a fairly uh, general scale, I mean, we it's not a, that they're not two worlds. I mean, where, where, where writers in English, uh, as we, it happens, and not to say even in English, of course, because we do write in people do write in many other languages. I mean, with Gaelic and uh, Welsh, and you know, uh, the, the Spanish and many other uh, languages in the United States. Of course, people people write in many languages. So I don't think there's, uh, um, and I certainly would not say one is superior to the other. Absolutely not. No, I mean, I wouldn't even go there uh, as a thing. I don't think anybody's creative writing is better than. Is superior to anybody else's. I mean, there are there is good writing, uh, there is enjoyable writing, there's entertaining writing, uh, there's amusing writing, and that's 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 universal. I would uh, I wouldn't want to go down that road at all. I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't think about it. Either. And was there another? <laughs> there's another question. Uh, I often feel authors are pretty much sure about the climax in fiction writing. I wish to listen to your insight on this. 
I mean, do they do they already have a message? That's why they know the ending and make the making the story as large as much possible. Or how does it work while ending the story? So basically, uh, it's about the climax. Yes. Okay. Well, I think different story, different writers, different story. I mean, different writers, of course, have different ways of writing. Some people will create frameworks and uh, will will, hang, will kind of hang the story and build around it. Other people will do it more. Um, sort of organically. Other ones will say, okay, here's my climax. This is where I want to arrive. They will arrive there. Uh, but I would also argue that uh, all stories need, I mean, um, I, I suggest that um, for many writers, this will change. Different stories require different things. I mean, that's going to be very interesting. Marty will, will be able to tell us about her process too, because uh, Marty's, Marty's got lots of experience too. Uh, and she can talk about that. And we've all worked with different writers and I think different writers do things differently. So do they already have a Message some do. You do need a climax at some point. It, it, it's a, it, uh, you, well, you could try writing a story without a climax. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to keep it, uh, to hold your reader's interest. We, and it's going to be probably be very difficult for yourself to make the story, keep the story moving. It may become a description. Uh, it may become uh, even an anecdote, though anecdotes tend to end on the, uh, end on the climax. Uh, so, so you need to, I, it could be that you will discover the climax as you go along because uh, you know, so very often stories develop. And that's one of the things about story writing uh, when you start, when you get down to it. Stories often take on a life of their own. And at some point, you need to let them take on a life of their own. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to lose control of them. Uh, you may then go back to the original version, having tried those things out. So you don't necessarily know where it ends. But you often have a sense of where it ends. And uh, sometimes you do know where it ends. And you, you're taking it there. Uh, Occasionally, um, maybe more than occasionally, again, I think it'd be nice to hear from Marty on this. Uh, they don't, it doesn't arrive where you intended, but that, that's absolutely fine. If it, if it arrives where, where it needs to go, uh, that, that's what you need to do. And so, yeah, the climax, you need a climax. Do you need it before? Not necessarily. Uh, do you need one at some point? Absolutely. Will it come? Almost certainly. Uh, and then you, you need to go on from there. Okay. Thank you, Amal. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, I'm sure writing a novel can be a very tedious task. So how do you sustain the energy and inspiration to finish one? Um, well, you could be interested. You could be very interested in what you're doing. That, that helps. Okay. Well, that, you have to have it. Uh, you also need to have discipline. That, that, that is very, very important. Uh, and you could need to spend time working on it. It's not going to, as we, we, we've talked about earlier, uh, the idea that these things require practice, these require, sorry, but, well, they require practice, obviously, but they require effort. So you're going to do that. Um, you're going to have to put that in. You need to put that effort in. It's going to, how do you keep it up? Uh, well, that's where having a community of writers or people who are interested or, or who are interested in your writing, uh, either way, but, but write, if sometimes I find having a community of writers is one of the greatest things. I mean, being able to just not necessarily tell the other writers the story, but even to just talk about it, because then you know, uh, it can help to know, uh, to know that you're not alone. Uh, and that where you're going is a journey that's worth continuing on. And people often have, well, they talk about, you know, first readers, second readers, mentors, etc. Writers often have this, or first listeners, first, sometimes because you need to talk the story out. I think those are those are very useful. But again, everybody needs to find their own way. Uh, but if if you're feeling alone and lost with your your writing, talk to somebody about it. Talk to other writers about it. Uh, people who who really want to put, who are willing to put the effort in, and they will uh, that that will help you. Uh, I think. Um, and go away and read. That often helps. I mean, if I've had a very busy period of uh, teaching, or for instance, or other other work, editing or other work. Sometimes I need to spend a few days just reading because that just gets me back in the mode. So if you are struggling with your writing, maybe go away, read for a bit and then come back. You don't have to read the same thing. Absolutely not. Read what you enjoy. Read what you want to read at that time. I suppose like many readers, I have uh, I often have more than one book on the go. So I picked the book that I uh, that appeals to me at that point in time. So kind of I do agree that you know it's very important for us to read. Um, if you want to become a good writer, you have to be a good reader. That's what I, that's how I feel. So, uh, what is uh, more interesting to you, writing short stories or writing short stories or writing a novel? Uh, it varies. It depends on what I'm at. I mean, I've written nonfiction. I've written history. I've written uh, 
drama. I've written short stories. I've written a novel. Uh, it depends. I, I don't. I think it depends on not quite on the time of the day. It's not that bad, but it depends on where you are at, the, uh, at a particular where I am at a particular point in time. Uh, and I'll often have more than one idea or project on the go. But I mean, they can take years, uh, and that's the thing. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know um, when I've had you know, I've had a family growing up, etc. So we spend time there. So that that takes well. And I'm sure again, you know, uh, the you. other parties who are here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's one question over here. I don't know uh, if uh, it is the right question or not. Can you tell about the admission process in Oxford? Now, we have two uh, scholars from Oxford talking to us. So I'm sure, you know, it's a long, it's a long way. And actually, this is a privilege, you know, to have you with us over here because it's like Oxford coming to Nepal and then coming with creative writing retreat again in July. So actually, it's a wonderful opportunity for those who cannot apply or who, for those who cannot afford to go uh, abroad. Um, but however, yeah. you sh share us a little about the process. Well, I mean, the information on how to apply to the Oxford Master's program, and of course, there, there, are number, there are different programs at Oxford. I also teach online courses, and I think a couple of my former students from my online courses have very kindly showed up there lurking around there. Uh, hi, Kinjal, and hi, Marty. Uh, sorry, uh, Melina, I become one. Marty is not one of my students, one of my colleagues. <laughs> so, um, so it's very nice of them to show. So the admission process, well, it's all on the website. If you just go to the website, you'll f find out out there. You've got to uh, fill in forms. You've got to uh, uh, write a portfolio. You've got to prepare some material that you're going to submit. Uh, you've got to write a covering letter. So take a look at those. I mean, actually, Nabin has been through this, so he, he can also tell you about it from the, if you want, at the... Uh, the cold face from that that end of it, you know, uh, so you can tell us how, how that works. So that's that's the process of it. It's a uh, it's a very transparent process. There are a number of uh, uh, deadlines that you can uh, dates that you can uh, apply uh, at, and but different. Uh, so we're, we're currently in the in the process of it. I think there's another deadline coming up. I've, I, I'm looking around, but I don't know where my notes are. So I didn't expect that question. I'm sorry. Uh, so, but but by, please do apply. I mean, this is something very important. We do we do want writers from very, very um, keen on having writers from around the world uh, and from a wide range of uh, backgrounds and uh, interests. And uh, yeah, so, so please do apply. It's, it's, uh, I know it's not very much of an answer. I'm sorry, it came out of the blue. I promise you it is on the website. and. Uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, well, 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 my, well, well, when I'm around, but then uh, uh, a wonderful administrator, so uh, the will answer you. Any other questions. Thank you, it has been wonderful talking to you and listening to you on various aspects of writing. And uh, uh, since there aren't any more questions at the moment, uh, uh, would you like to introduce Marty? I, I would. I would be delighted to introduce Marty. Just give me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. It gives, have questions for Marty as well. Okay. It gives me and Nadine a very, very great pleasure to introduce a surprise guest. Uh, she did say she was coming, but I mean, we're really, really grateful that you're willing to come on, Marty. Lovely to see you. Haven't we haven't met in person for well, nearly a year, over a year now, which is. Uh, which is unusual. We usually see each other several times a year at Oxford, but we haven't seen her. So Marty is a wonderful writer. Uh, Marty has uh, Marty's written uh, seven novels, including, well, as uh, um, Nabin mentioned, uh, Daniel Isn't Talking, uh, and uh, the uh, New York Times bestseller, Dying Young, which went on to be, become a film. Her, her novel, Dragon, uh, Dragonfly Girl, has just come out. And it is, uh, it's, um, uh, it's why it's just come out and it's getting wonderful reviews as it absolutely rightly deserves. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Marty Lampak. Thank you. Nice to see you, Omar. <laughs> Lovely to see you. <laughs> it's, it's really unexpected. Great. And Nadine. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I feel like I'm sitting around my friends. It's great. <laughs> Hello, Saguna. Thank you for inviting me. Welcome, welcome, Marty, and that's so nice of you to agree to come in, just step into our talk, you know, and you've been there backstage all the while, so it's really a pleasure having you with us. Um, thank you so much for joining, and we'd really love to hear from you about your novel, about okay. the movies that have been ad adapted on your novel. Uh, I read that Julia Roberts uh, was one of one, one of in uh, the novel that you wrote. Mm -hmm. So 
Can you please share the floor? Uh, you well, um, I have to say that that was a kind of unusual circumstance. You don't normally, uh, when you write a novel, you should never be thinking uh, that this is all about getting it to Hollywood. Um, however, there will be the occasional novel that for whatever reasons, and we can talk about what those reasons are if you like, um, strikes and begins to be something that um, a different audience would like to address. And when that novel is purchased, I want just to make very clear um, that almost the first thing they do is kind of write the author straight out of the picture. Um, they will take your work as a novelist and they will completely uh, redo it into a different format because whenever we change media, whenever we change from one genre, um, say a, a long form novel, um, to another genre, be that poetry or drama or you know film, everything about it changes. So I um, was very lucky in that the, the the movie came out because it simply meant that the novel itself got a higher profile and um, became something that's you know sort of stuck around for a much longer time than it might otherwise have done. However, since then I've written other novels, some of which have been optioned, most of which have not been, um, which might even be better books. But that's not really the issue. Um, the issue is sort of um, you kind of get lucky or you kind of don't. Um, my latest book, Dragonfly Girl, I, of course, would hope that uh, someone would take an interest in that and its sequel, which is called Academy One. But if they don't, that's OK. That's not why I'm here. I'm here as a novelist on this earth. Thank you so much, Marty. Uh, there's one question. Probably you could answer that question. Um, what would be your suggestion on making the stories purposeful? How can one, uh, how can a beautiful piece of fiction move beyond the aesthetics and touch more pressing, pressing issue? Is there a, oh, the question seems to be very long. There are multiple questions over here. Is there a golden mean between aesthetically appealing writing and also at the same time addressing the pressing issue beyond personal musings head on? If yes, <laughs> what? Your suggestions to aspire for that so probably all of you can share about this beginning with oh. okay well this opens up a whole discipline <laughs> about aesthetics so i won't um get too far into it i really love to hear um what naveen has to say about this as he's a poet um i think what the 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 question is about is to what extent do we um attend to those things that interest us personally or perhaps the language that interests us or that makes us excited about writing, how do we balance this with what we'd call a big book, um, a big story? Um, and I think that the, some of the, our, our best, most memorable novels, and that's really the only form to which I'm now speaking, would be those that take a, a kind of large external big uh, look at something. And then within that large picture, that external uh, problem, say um, in the case of Academy One, which I'm now writing, a girl is stuck in a, a terrible situation in a kind of school and she must escape it, but she, and she could just escape it, except there's another complication. So the external pressure is there, that there's this academy, which is kind of this evil academy, but there's another story and that story is much more personal. And that story is about her relationships with people within the academy. So lots of times in novels, we see more than one story taking place. We see that big story that you kind of, uh, I'm speaking to the person who asked the question, uh, is alluding to when you say, you know, pressing, pressing issues or, you know, the bigger picture or whatever. We've got that big story, that, but we also have another story or other stories which are much more personal smaller and on other threads, which are nonetheless critical to making that book be memorable. Now, how, how is it memorable? Why does this matter? Um, funny enough, the big picture doesn't really matter unless those smaller issues matter a lot. And that's because um, otherwise we just look at news stories. News stories are the big picture. Why would we need drama? We need drama because we wanna see the change we want to see the change from that character at the moment that they started within the story. Where did they start from? And we will compare that to where they end. They must have a personal stake in that story that causes a change inside them. We're thirsty for that as readers. We are reluctant as human beings to want to change. Sometimes we do want to change. We don't even know how. 
But when we see change, we see something dynamic. And when we see that dynamic movement, we're drawn in. And we're also drawn in by the externals. Of course we are. That often is the decision basis on which we decide, well, am I going to watch this film? Am I going to read this novel? What's it about? Okay. But honestly, it doesn't really matter what it's about. If you don't have those characters, we care about changing through progressive complications within the structure of the book to something different from whoever they were when they started out. I see a question. For you. Yes, there's a comment for you. Okay, it says, hi, Mari, thanks for sharing good stuff. Do you think you were born as a novelist or is it something that you've achieved with hard work and dedication? Excellent question. I was not born a novelist. <laughs> I was just, um, I, was, I was maybe a little bit more communicative, maybe a little bit more driven. Um, to do long-term internal projects because one of the characteristics of a novelist is they must be alone for a great deal of time. Now, when I say alone, sometimes it's nice to be alone, but within a larger context, like a residency. So you're sort of alone, but not alone because you need to have time to write the thing, but you also need that structure around you to reinforce your identity as a novelist. So I wasn't born a novelist, but I had something early on that really did help me. I had lots of things. One I had was an example. So my mother was a journalist. So, okay, I'm not a journalist. But what I did see was her dedication to writing and her affinity with words, with language, with books. And so these things became what I valued too. It's very hard to be a novelist when you're born into a family that just doesn't, um, or a culture or a village or a whatever, it doesn't value this stuff. You've got to value it. And so if you have people around you who value it, then you have an advantage. So in that sense, I was born to become a writer or at least a communicator in some respect. I hope that answers your question. There is a lot of hard work, by the way. It's pretty boring. You need to sit down and you need to just get stuck into the work, even when it's very frustrating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your words with us, Marty. It was wonderful having you with us, you know, and just, I'm really humbled uh, by, you know, I, I, I really feel happy that you're so humility personified that you stepped in with us at the last moment. So as a part, I think the session is uh, uh, almost one and a half hour long. So as a parting note, I uh, would love if you all share anything to the viewers. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll just bounce off Marty's last oh, wait, wait. Yes, I, I was hoping to say. Okay, I was hoping to say um, Marty, I mean, nobody's, Gragi, nobody's born a writer, but, but, but having having a community of some form, and it's not necessarily a massive community, it could be just having a, a sibling, a friend, you know, uh, somebody across the road who, who reads and has books. I mean, this idea of books behind us. And this, I mean, now it's become a Zoom thing, everybody, or these, uh, in, 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 but having somebody who reads, I mean, I grew up, I mean, I grew up, okay, I grew up in Calcutta, so Kolkata, as we call it. <laughs> now it's not far from, from Nepal in that sense. Um, and I went to school just across the world, but we had books. I mean, and I grew up in a culture. I mean, my, my parents read books. We had books in the house. I was just allowed to read anything in the house. I mean, I read stuff that was entirely inappropriate in the sense of, I didn't even know what it was about. I was, I was reading, uh, and I was reading Gawky at the age of 10. I had no idea what I was reading. I mean, <laughs> do not waste your time reading Gawky. Well, by all means, read Gawky at the age of 10. I don't know what it'll do to you. It doesn't seem to have done me any harm, but it was there. I said, can I read that? It's like, okay, read it. So I read, read so she read these things and was surrounded by people who liked reading and writing. And of course, I mean, uh, those of you well, in Nepal, you may know that, you know, the parts where Kolkata is known for, or Kolkata is known for, for being slightly obsessed by reading. They have a book fair, which is enormous. And everybody, that's what I see all my friends read. Many of my friends didn't read, uh, and uh, which was an advantage in, in, a, in the school sometimes, because we only allowed one or two books a week. So I used to run a gang of people. They, they, they didn't read, so they all borrowed books. So that meant I got six or seven books a week. Um, so, which I, my brother's read, etc. But I'm the only one who writes fiction, so that's the way it goes. Yeah. That kind of feeds into, I, I think, yeah, you, you, you need, I mean, I have a huge, huge admiration for people who, 
who come into writing when they don't have the advantages that Marty and I, and uh, I, I think Nabi and you two have of growing up where people around you are reading. And for them, I have enormous, enormous admiration is all I can say. Thank you, Amar. Nabin, would you like to share something as a parting note? Emphasizing on uh, on our viewers to join the writing retreat, of course. <laughs> uh, yes, Saguna. Uh, uh, just a small note about uh, I and Amal talking in case like due to COVID restriction or in case if you had to postpone the residency, we're thinking of doing that in October. So we'll do in uh, consent with Saguna and the Bookaholics team. So just wanted to uh, share this with the viewers. And uh, uh, as I said that uh, Marty, uh, my guru, uh, she's got a dragonfly girl uh, recently come out. So I would like maybe, uh, I mean, uh, request Bookaholics, you know, to do some sessions in Nepal. And uh, I mean, she's, uh, I don't have to say anything about her. Uh, this is the eighth novel and uh, other than that i want to thank uh, everybody and uh, saguna bookaholics team ganesh ji behind uh, was doing work at the back and uh, i would love to see you all at the uh, residency and before going i'll just read a small poem uh dedicated to you all if i have the permission so <laughs> is it okay with the time yeah okay yes of uh, course yeah, I've, I've shared this poem with uh, Marty as well. So, <laughs> in the dark. Sitting by the window in Berlin, the yellow labanum trees brightly lit on the pavement, I think of home. It is night in Nepal. And in my house on the backyard, my mother has planted cucumber, pumpkin, chilies, and maize. They grow in the dark. The cauliflower rises to the sky in a dull embrace. The beans curl up the bamboo lattice a millimeter at a time. By the time my neighbor's cock crows in the morning, the colors from the fields will have silently entered the roses. The papaya sweetens. So many things grow in the night, in the absence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Navin. Didn't I say you are so nostalgic? <laughs> You're so nostalgic all the time. Thank you very much. Marty, would you like to share a few words? Just to say thank you very much for inviting me on and that it is such a pleasure to be among you. I super respect for Amal and for Nabin and for everybody who is bringing out new writers, writing themselves and, you know, helping those of us writing to, to, to get our word out. So bless you and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so should we part because there are no questions. So I think it's time that we uh, take a leave. Thank you very much once again, all three of you. It has been a wonderful experience having you here virtually with us. And we're looking forward to Mist and Mountain's creative writing workshop in Nepal in June. I hope the viewers today uh, have many things to take away from this talk. And I'm sure there will be few interested ones who would be joining us uh, in June. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, you know, for being here with us. Thank you.